everyone, I'm Carly. Welcome back to High Country Homesteading. Today, we are gonna be making a full Hanukkah meal from scratch. And I'm gonna be showing you the foods that I've grown up eating during Hanukkah time. And some of them are gonna be done a little bit differently than what I'm used to, which is going to be a lot less store-bought items and more everything handmade from scratch. So we're all about trying to hone in our skills and learn new things on this channel. So this is definitely something new that I've never done. I've never made all of these items from scratch and I've also never made them all by myself before. So it's just my little family for Hanukkah this year. Typically it's a big family affair. So I'm going to be doing all this myself and seeing how it turns out. So I'd love for you to watch along with me. The things that we're gonna be making today are a beef brisket with carrots and celery, challah bread, latkes from scratch with some homemade applesauce, a noodle kugel, a sweet one with cinnamon and raisins. And also for dessert, we're going to be making my mom's traditional forgotten cookies, which are a meringue cookie with chocolate chips. So I hope you join along with me and let me know, what do you typically do for Hanukkah? We typically gather everybody together for at least one night and have the big party with the full meal, all the grandkids and kids opening presents at the same time. And then we're pretty mellow for the other seven nights. So let me know, do you like to do the first night of Hanukkah, the last night? somewhere in the middle. Um, we just typically pick a day that everybody's free and that's when we have our big Hanukkah party. So I'm going to put on my apron, probably tie my hair up and let's get started cooking. First, we're gonna start with our challah cause that's gonna take the longest to put together. There's multiple proofing sessions for it to rise and so we're not gonna be baking this for probably four to five hours. So. First step is that we need to mix the yeast with water. So I have a large glass mixing bowl here. This is a quarter cup of lukewarm water. So I'm going to put that in the bowl and we're going to mix that with one packet of active dry yeast. Now, I honestly can't say that I've ever baked with yeast before. This is our first time and we will see how that turns out. So I'm putting the yeast in and then the recipe also calls for a teaspoon of sugar. So we'll put that in as well. And then we will just mix this together a bit. And then we're supposed to let that sit for 10 minutes and let it proof. And it's supposed to get all bubbly and fizzy. So we're gonna come back after 10 minutes and see what happened. All right, so it's been about 10 minutes and we have some bubbles in our yeast. It's looking a bit expanded. So I think that's a good sign. So now what I'm going to add to this is I have another cup and a quarter of lukewarm water. So we're going to add that in. We need to add in two teaspoons of salt. So let's do one and two. We need to add in a third cup of honey. And then we need to add in one whole egg as well as three egg yolks. And this is perfect because we need three egg whites for our meringue cookies that we're gonna be making later for dessert. So that works out perfectly. So I'm gonna add one egg and then we're going to separate the yolks from the whites and we will save the whites in the fridge for later use for our cookies. Just a future note about the honey. I like my challah a little bit sweeter than how this turned out. 
So next time I try it, I think I'm gonna up it to at least a half a cup of honey instead of a third a cup and see how that turned out. So we will cover this up and save the whites in the fridge for later and then we will mix up the rest of our dough. The recipe then calls for four and a half to six cups of flour. And I'll be sure to leave the recipe that I'm referencing in the description box below. But I started with a cup at a time and I found that I needed all six cups in, for, in order for the dough not to be so sticky. It was not getting rid of the stickiness. So I found that I needed to add all six cups and even honestly a little more would have helped with the stickiness. So I don't know if mine was extra sticky for some reason, but I used all six. And the recipe also says this makes one giant challah and two mediums. And I had set out to make the two mediums, but in the end felt like I only wanted to roll out one challah. And let me tell you, it was giant. You will see that later. But when they say this makes one giant challah, it definitely does. Next, I'm bringing a pot of water to boil on the stove, and we're gonna use that later for our first rise. And then I am taking the dough out of my bowl, cleaning out all the flour and the stickiness that's in it. And then I'm going to be putting just a little bit of olive oil in the bowl, and I'm going to coat the dough on both sides with the olive oil. Then we're gonna cover it with a tea towel and we're going to put our pot of boiling water underneath the dough in the stove. So on your bottom rack and then the dough on the top rack. And that's what we're gonna do our proof in for an hour. So moving on to our latkes, I have two and a half pounds of Yukon Gold potatoes here and one large onion. So what we're going to do now is we're going to peel these potatoes so that we can get them shredded. And we're just going to take the peel off of this onion and chop it in half. We don't need to hand chop it because we're going to be using the food processor to rip it up into smaller bits. Now, my family's done lakas any which way that you possibly could. We've shredded them ourselves with the food processor, which is what I'm going to do today. We've used frozen shredded hash browns. We've gotten Trader Joe's latkes, the frozen ones from the store, and just reheated those in the oven. We've ordered them from a delicious nearby restaurant and just had those for our meal, which was amazing. So we've done latkes pretty much any way that you can think of. I've hand grated them before, which is also an option if you don't have a food processor, but to save time and energy today, we're going to go with the food processor. Lockers are hands down my favorite part of the meal. Um, tell me, are you sour cream or are you an applesauce fan? I personally can't stand sour cream and I have never put sour cream on a latke, so I am applesauce only, and I've actually never made my own applesauce, which is what we're gonna do today. So that is what I'm gonna be putting on my latkes. So do you like one or the other, or a little bit of both? So next we're gonna run our potatoes through the food processor. Now, if you don't have a food processor, you can use a box grater, use the larger holes that will result in better latkes. And also my food processor came with two shredding plates. So one has smaller holes and one is larger, and I'm gonna use the larger. So we're gonna pop that in, put the lid on, and we're going to put our potatoes through here. Now you may need to cut your potatoes 
in half. Some small ones might fit, but some of the bigger ones might be a little too wide to fit in there, so just cut them to size. So what you're about to see here is me taking a good handful of potatoes to realize that my potatoes are not coming out in shreds, they're coming out in thick slices. Whoops, already failed that. <laughs> I accidentally put my thing on upside down and it started slicing them instead of shredding them. Remember which side you need to have up. And I would recommend that you use, if your food processor comes with two discs like mine does, there's a bigger whole shred or in a smaller whole shred. So I'm using the bigger size for the potatoes and then I recommend using the smaller whole size for the onions. So I'm throwing all of the potato shreds into this bowl just to set aside for the moment. And potatoes, after they're cut brown, really, really quickly. So it's advised to cover your potatoes in cold water just to try to stop the browning process and keep them as fresh as possible. So they're going to be full of cold water while we just set them inside and then shred our onion. So important part of latkes is that you need to get as much moisture out of the potatoes as possible because we're going to be frying them in oil and we want them to be crispy. So the first step of that, I'm just draining them in a colander and I'm adding the onion to it. And then the next step is we're just using a tea towel and pouring the mixture into that. And then you're just going to wrap it up and squeeze as much moisture as you can out if you have a cheesecloth around, you could do it with this too, but a tea towel works just fine. But I'm just using all my might and twisting it and squeezing as much moisture as I possibly can out, and that will make for the best latkes. So we're going to add our dried potato and onion back to our clean and dried bowl. And we're going to use a fork just to mix this up a little bit and make sure that the onion is incorporated. Just using this fork that I used to beat a couple of eggs and stir this up. And now we're gonna add all of our binding ingredients. So I have two large eggs here just beaten together that we're going to add to the mix. I have about three quarters of a cup of matzo meal, which I just got from the Manischewitz matzo ball mix. We will add that in as our binder. Recipe also calls for a tablespoon of potato starch, but I have arrowroot starch arrowroot powder you can use um, corn starch if you needed to as well add that in and then we're going to add in about half a teaspoon of salt and pepper and we will just mix that all up together I'm heating up my skillet on the stove and 
I'm adding some avocado oil for frying our latkes. Now, using avocado oil because it supposedly has the highest smoke point and more about that later, but I'm probably adding it about a quarter inch thick, that about. And so what we're going to also add is, this is called considered schmaltz, uh, which is just rendered chicken fat, as you could see. And I got this from the frozen section of my grocery store. Now, I don't have my own rendered chicken fat. Maybe that's something I learn how to do in the future, but for now, we got it from the store. So I'm going to add that and let it melt. And this just gives it a more salty traditional flavor, which is absolutely delicious. And once we have that all melted, then we're going to make our latke patties. So I'm just using a scoop to try to make them a bit uniform, but we're just going to scoop them up and squish them between our hands try to make them as thin as you can but they are quite delicate so they will fall apart on you if you're not careful so i just roll it into a ball try to pat it as thin as i can um, this first batch was a little thicker than i'd like but the thinner obviously the crispier and just lay them as gently as you can in the pan you can probably only fit about four maybe five at a time but you're going to need to do this in small batches and once they're brown on the first side, then you're just gonna flip them over to the next side for a couple of minutes and let those crisp up as well. And then I just have this cookie uh, wire rack to the side with paper towels lined underneath. So that's where I'm going to set them once they're done cooking in the oil, just so they can drip off any excess oil and dry on that rack. But here is honestly where I really need help because I have never, and I mean not once, fried something in oil on my stove and not set off the fire alarm. And I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I use the high smoke point oils that I've read everywhere and been recommended to use, and that doesn't help. I don't know if I'm using way too high of heat and I just underestimate how powerful stoves are. What am I doing wrong? because every single time, also counting this time, I set off the smoke alarms in my house. It's loud. My kids were napping at this time and they certainly did not appreciate being woken up from their nap by the smoke alarms going off. Uh, so that wasn't fun, but it's every single time and I don't know what I'm doing wrong and I would love help or is this something that happens to everybody and it's just an unspoken thing that nobody talks about? That I would like to know as well. So is it just me setting off my smoke alarm every time I use oil or is that some kind of unspoken rule? I would really love to know. Could you please let me know in the comments what you do about this and what is it that I'm missing? Because I would love to not do that anymore. And that would be great. Thank you very much. Also, I was speaking over this, but you just saw me take the bread dough out of the oven because it had been an hour and I just punched it down to deflate it a little bit. And then I just set it back in there for another hour and it's going to do another rise. And I was very happy to see that it rose really, really nicely. So that was a good sign that it's going to turn out. And then next I'm going to, while my last batch of latkes is going, put some water on the stove to boil again. And this is what we're going to cook our egg noodles in for the kugel. So I'm just doing a small kugel. Um, I only baked it in an eight by eight dish since it's just my small family eating it. So I only used about six ounces of noodles. And these are all the latkes all done sitting out to cool on the cooling rack. While the egg noodles are cooking on the stove, I'm using the same food processor that I've cleaned out from earlier and I'm mixing together three large eggs, about two tablespoons of melted butter, 
one cup of sour cream, four ounces of cream cheese, about half a cup of sugar, and then four ounces, which is half a cup of cottage cheese, as well as a sprinkle of salt. Once that's all combined, I'm just spraying a Pyrex dish with some nonstick spray. And then I'm pouring our drained egg noodles in there. And then I'm just pouring the mixture on top of it, getting it all mixed in. The sweet kugel version I'm used to includes raisins. So I'm sprinkling in some here and just mixing that in well. And then for the top, you're just going to sprinkle on a little bit of sugar and then sprinkle some cinnamon on top over that. And this is just going to set aside until our oven is freed up. And it's just gonna cook at 350 for about an hour. And now this second rice has been done for our challah. So I have taken it out of the oven and I'm punching it back down. And then I'm just going to flour my clean surface and I'm going to take the dough out and we're going to start rolling it. Now, challah is traditionally a braided bread, so you can do it a number of ways. This time I'm only going for a three strand braid because I'm not a pro yet and I don't know how to do the four strand. So we're going to do regular three strand braid. I was lazy and for some reason didn't take out my pastry cutter, which would have made this part a lot easier, but here we are. And I've just managed to get the dough into roughly three equal parts and setting those each aside. And we're basically doing a regular blade like you do would do in your hair. So the goal is that we want to roll each of these parts out into equal sizes and we're going to roll them into skinny strands so that we can do our braid. And I found that this dough was super elastic and I was not expecting that. So when I rolled it out, it would just completely spring back. So it was pretty difficult. I'm not sure if that's the way it's supposed to be, but the holla turned out perfect. So I'm expecting that's the case, but I just did my best to roll it out to a decent size. Um, I tried to get it as long as I could, but honestly, it was pretty difficult. But you know, you don't want a short, stubby holla, so I tried to get it a little longer. And then what I'm doing here is just rolling up the dough so that it's kind of in a cylinder shape. And then I'm, you will see later after I do all three of these, I'm gonna try to stretch it out a little bit longer so that we can get a decent braid going. So once I've rolled all three strands, I'm then going back and just trying to stretch them out even longer so that we have decent strands to work with for the braid. So I just tried a bunch of ways. I tried to start in the middle and kind of roll out with my hands, which didn't really do much. Um, the best way I found was to just use gravity to try to stretch it out a little bit and pull it very, very gently so that it didn't break apart, but just to try to stretch those strands. I need a better technique next time. I'm sure there's a much better way, but I just used what I got and stretched them out a little bit more. And this is the size that I ended up with. And so I set them up like we're going to braid hair with the three strands next to each other. And then I just kind of start halfway down so put sides in the middle like you would for a normal braid and just kept braiding that down. And then once I got to the bottom, I just did the top half separately, which I found was a pretty easy way to do this. And then when you get to the ends, you just kind of tuck them over so that it's rounded on each end. 
Then I transferred the holla to a parchment lined cookie sheet. And then what we're just doing here is we have an egg that we're going to combine with a little bit of water and salt and just scramble that together for an egg wash. And I'm taking a um, pastry brush and just going to brush the egg wash all over the top of the holla. So now I'm taking out my cute recipe book that my mom and my mother-in-law made me when I first got married. It was a gift for my bridal shower of just a bunch of family recipes and things that I traditionally ate growing up. So here's our meringue cookie, which we also called forgotten cookies recipe that I'm taking out. And we're gonna reference to make our cookies. So we are adding three egg whites that we separated earlier to our mixer, a cup of sugar, and we're just going to mix that together. We're also going to add a dash of salt as well as about three quarters of a teaspoon of vanilla. And we're going to beat this on high until it gets stiff peaks, which I found to take a little longer than I expected. I did start this on medium speed, but you probably could have gone straight to high speed. And it's gonna take you a good five to 10 minutes or so to get those stiff peaks. Next, we're gonna add in our chocolate chips. I ended up using the rest of a bag that I had of a full size, and then the next bag I opened was minis, but you can use whatever you want added in here, but we always traditionally do chocolate chips, and then you're just going to very gently fold that in, and always add more, of course, if you need to, which I always do, and we're gonna fold that in nicely. And then once that's mixed, I have another cookie sheet with just some tin foil laid on it. And I'm going to spray that as well because these will stick. So I highly recommend that you have some kind of non-stick um, Sprite oil. So I'm just using a cookie scoop and these are not going to rise like a normal cookie would because we don't have any rising agents in here. There's no baking soda or anything like that. So these are going to keep the exact shape that you put them in on the cookie sheet. So they're gonna be very wonky, different shapes. They're also quite a crumbly cookie. So they kind of have a crumbly exterior, but a soft interior. It's a very interesting texture. Um, and if you've never had a meringue cookie before, I suggest you try it. So I am just scooping these out. I ended up using a second cookie sheet and filling it about halfway. And then into my oven, I popped these at 300 degrees for about 25 minutes. And the forgotten part is that you would heat up your oven at night and then turn your oven off and leave the cookies in all night and they will just slowly cook that way. That's the forgotten part, but if you need them in a pinch and forgot to do them at night, 25 minutes is fine. So once I pulled those cookies out, I upped my oven back to 350 degrees, and that's when I put in my challah as well as the kugel, and they're both going to bake for 60 minutes at 350 degrees. So I've taken our forgotten cookies out. I have put the noodle kugel and the challah in, and those both cook at the same temperature for the same amount of time. So that was very easy, and now, before we start on the brisket, I'm gonna go ahead and get our applesauce going because I think that's supposed to be the easiest thing that we're going to do today. So what I have here, I have four really small Honeycrisp apples, and then I have one of something else that I can't actually be sure what it is, but it's on the sweeter side. So I have our cutting board, our knife out again. I also have our peeler, and we're going to peel these like we did in Thanksgiving for our apple pie. And we're gonna peel them, chop them up into little pieces. I'm gonna put them in a pot with some water, some sugar, and some cinnamon. 
And then once those get taken off the stove, we're just gonna mash them up and hopefully have applesauce. So let's do it. To the apples, I'm adding three quarter cup of water, about quarter cup of brown sugar, and then I added in probably anywhere from about a half a teaspoon to a teaspoon of ground cinnamon. And then we are going to set that on the stove and let it cook on medium heat for about, I think it was 20 to 25 minutes. So we have our apples going on the stove. We have lots of dishes piling up in the sink. And now we're going to get started on chopping everything we need for our brisket. So I'm going to be cutting in half the recipe that I'm using. Hers is for about a five to seven pound brisket, but mine's only two and three quarter pounds. So pretty small. So I'm cutting that in half. And what we're using is about half a pound of carrots that we're going to be peeling. I've washed some celery that we're going to be chopping up. I also have about five, six cloves of garlic. And then for the sauce, I have tomatoes. Now you can use um, a can of to crushed tomatoes if you'd like to, but I have these that need to be used or else they're going to go bad. So I'm going to cut those up. So let's get started peeling carrots and we'll be on our way with the brisket. Got to grab an onion. We're gonna need that as well. Don't forget to save the ends of your and your celery for when you make broth. I just keep mine in this Ziploc bag in the freezer and it just keeps it good until you have enough bones to make broth or stock or bone broth, whatever you want. And then you just dump this in with the bones and you just use scraps. garlic's going to be blended up so we don't have to chop it all too much, honestly. Nor do we really need to do much to these tomatoes. I'm probably just going to chop them in half. onion scraps too. So we've yet again washed out our food processor and you can certainly use a blender for this part if you want. But to the food processor we're going to add our tomatoes. We're going to add all of our chopped garlic. We're 
This is three quarters of a cup of beef stock. also going to do a quarter cup of brown sugar. And then we also need an eighth of a cup of apple cider vinegar. This most closely resembles my grandmother's brisket recipe growing up. That's why I chose it. The more tomatoey based um, brisket recipe. Now hers traditionally uses, I believe the Heinz chili sauce, a packet of Lipton onion soup, and then a can of Coke, which I know is popular in brisket recipes. So this is the closest I found with using a little bit more whole ingredients. Also, can't forget some salt. And pepper. Yeah, so I know there's a lot out there, but this is traditionally the flavors that I'm used to eating. So we're going to blend this up and then we will put our brisket on the stove and probably our apples should be done. All right, that's all nice and blended and we will wait to use that in a little bit. So we're at the 40 minute mark with our challah and it's already looking incredible and it's huge. <laughs> It blew up so good. So what we're going to do now is put egg wash in the center where it's now spread apart and it didn't really get that egg wash originally. So we're just going to fill in the center with the rest of our egg wash and then we're going to put it back in the oven for about 20 minutes. I'm going to tent this with foil because it's already looking so brown on the top that I don't want it to burn. So tent it with oil a little bit and put it back in the oven. And we will take that out and our kugel out at the same time. Moving back to our stove, I'm using the same skillet as before. I'm putting some more avocado oil in it, and this is where we're going to put our brisket. So I've rinsed and dried the brisket, and we're adding salt and pepper on both sides and searing it in the skillet to brown it a couple minutes on each side. So start with one side, flip it over, and then I try to sear it on, it on the edges for just a little bit as well to get all the flavor locked in. And while that's happening, I've taken the apples off the stove because they're nice and hot. And I use my potato masher, but it really wasn't mashing as well as I wanted it to. So I don't show this on camera, but after I mash it here, I realize I need to hit it with the immersion blender and that worked very, very nicely. So. Put it in the blender or use your hand immersion blender if you have one instead of using just the hand masher. That's what I would recommend. taken the brisket out and just set it aside on a plate and adding a little bit more oil. I'm going to add the onions that we chopped up and put those in for a little bit. And then after that, I'm going to add the carrots and celery that we chopped up as well. 
So we're just going to get those starting to soften just a little bit, but they will soften plenty while cooking in the oven. And then I'm going to put in about a cup or so of more beef stock just so that we can get up all of those brown bits that were left over in the pan by the brisket and mix that in with our vegetables for good flavor. To prepare our brisket, I'm just using my 9 by 13 inch Pyrex pan. Um, the recipe says to use a roasting pan, but I feel like my brisket's so small that we can fit it in here. So we're going to take about half of our tomato mixture and just put it in the bottom of the pan. And then we're going to set our brisket on top with the fat cap facing up. So fat cap side up. And then we want to pour all of our vegetables and drip things on top. And then the rest of our tomato sauce. And this is gonna go in the oven for about an hour a pound. So mine's gonna be give or take two and a half to three hours. Okay, I'm back two seconds later to say you're supposed to put a layer of parchment and then a layer of aluminum foil on top. I wanna share a couple of notes on how this turned out. The flavor was really good, but I would honestly up the flavor components so like salt pepper garlic vinegar and it was also a lot of liquid so I would probably cut down the amount of broth in tomato it wasn't a bad thing but it seemed like it was a decent amount of liquid also the cooking time was too long for me I checked it a little after two hours and it was overdone so I should have checked it a lot sooner than that it could have been because my oven rack was too high from earlier and I forgot to move it back down to the middle. So we'll try again next time. Okay, we're finished. Everything turned out pretty much like I expected it to. And when I was putting this out for the photo op, I realized this is quite the brown meal. And um, well, honestly, I think the best tasting foods are pretty brown. So I'm excited about it and maybe next time I'll steam some green beans or something to brighten it up a little bit and make it a little more colorful. But I'm excited to dig into this meal. It's dark outside, it is dinner time, I'm hungry and I can't wait to taste all of these delicious foods. So thank you so much for joining me today and let me know if you try any of these recipes or and I especially want to know what's on your table for Hanukkah. I would love to know what you and your family cook traditionally and if you make anything in particular from scratch that you love, please share it with me in the comments. And I'm just so happy to be able to enjoy this meal and I hope you and your family and friends have a wonderful, happy Hanukkah and I'll see you next time. Bye. Thank you.